Hello friends, this is Jane O'Neill from Culturally Curious, and it has been far too long since we've seen each other in person, but I'm really happy to have this chance to share this program with you and for all of us to spend a little time looking at art and thinking about art together. So our program for today is called Parisian Cafes and Impressionist Painting. How lucky are we that we get to spend the next hour or so looking at some of the most beautiful images created in the 19th century. So let's dive in. I wanted to share with you an overview of the program, how we'll be spending the next hour or so. And so what I'd like to do is just sort of review the basics of Impressionism with you, just so that we're all up to speed on what makes an Impressionist painting, although I know most of you are very familiar with this by now. I also want to talk about why we're going to be looking at cafes as a subject matter and why did the Impressionist artists take up cafes as a subject matter. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the influence of realism, how that factored in. Next, we'll consider the role of the flaneur. The French flaneur is a uh, is a type of individual that was sort of conceived of around the same time as the rise of Impressionism. So we'll talk about how those two things sort of came together, particularly when it came to looking at modern life and how sort of the feminist art, histori art historical idea of the male gaze kind of plays a role in that too. Then we will dive deep into looking at these images of cafes and cafe concerts and we'll be looking at the work of Renoir, Degas, and Manet, some of the best. And then we'll wrap up by thinking about how and why these artists' works sort of changed, why they chose different subjects later in their careers, and how some post-impressionist artists kind of took up the mantle and began painting the cafes. So the image that I have up here on the screen, just so you can see it well, is um, an image done by sort of a lesser known artist. Um, his name is Raffaele, Jean-Francois Raffaele. This is from 1886. And um, the title of the work is Bohème's Au Café. And it's a depiction of the Café Guerbois, which is a, uh, was an actual café in Paris where most of the Impressionist artists spent their time, including Monet, Renoir, um, Degas, um, even Cezanne. Uh, we do know that um, this is where they went to sort of share ideas and probably critique each other. In fact, the artist Manet got into a duel with an art critic here, <laughs> um, critic who obviously didn't view his work very favorably. Um, he did not kill the critic in the duel and they actually remained friends afterwards. But this is just sort of a preview as to how lively these places could be. <laughs> All right, so let's start off thinking about French Impressionism. Isn't this work just a wonderful breath of fresh air? This is a place where anybody would like to be right now, right? It feels almost like a day in May in New England. Um, what we're looking at is sort of an iconic work when it comes to Impressionism. This is Monet's 1873 painting, The Poppies, or The Poppy Fields. And so we have a very sort of um, Impressionist, uh, a sort of full Impressionist style here. It's very sort of, uh, it's rendered in a very sketchy manner with visible brush strokes or sometimes what are called broken brush strokes. Um, the artist here is not attempting to create an illusionistic window onto another world. Instead, he sort of dabbled paint on the surface of the canvas, um, knowing that our eye and our mind kind of work together to understand these elements, um, the red dabs of, of paint on the surface as a field full of poppies. And it is just um, a suggestion of this beautiful, glorious, <laughs> sunny day. Um, and it's very evocative. Uh, and, it, and this is so representative of what people think of when they think of Impressionist painting, sort of a bright palette, a beautiful day, um, a suggestion of, of kind of upper class life here because we have these um, two women accompanied by small children. And you don't really have the suggestion 
of any care in the world. It's just, um, it's pure beauty, really. Um, so let's take a look at how Monet and other French Impressionist artists were creating these types of works. So the painting that we're looking at here was created the same year. The artist in this case is Renoir, Auguste Renoir. And he, this is a painting of Claude Monet at work in his garden. And this is such a great sort of informative painting for us because it shows us so much about the Impressionist process. First and foremost, we have artists that are working outside on plein air, as the French call it, and that is so important. Most artists worked in their studios and sort of labored over making something look precise and perfect. And here are these artists working outside, kind of dashing things off really quickly. We have the idea that you have to transport all your materials outside to whatever location where you'd like to work. And so you have small um, canvases, you have a light easel, and you have um, really sort of compact materials. In generations prior, artists would have had to um, ground up their own pigments, sometimes using animal bladders to contain the pigments, sometimes using glass beakers. Now you have the innovation of paint tubes. So that makes this process so simple. You can just grab your little kit and go outside and paint. So we have um, the artists working outdoors, creating an informal and really sort of immediate sense of his surroundings or in some cases her surroundings. Um, and we see that the artists aren't really attempting to create a photographic representation of the world. In so many ways, this is um, a movement that is sort of anti-photographic. They know that there's a way to create sort of a perfect record of something. This is a great way to create an evocative um, impression of something. But we will see how a lot of these Im images have been influenced by photography. So next up, we have this idea of capturing light. So here are two other works by Claude Monet. These are both done um, in the early 1890s. The work on the right is at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and they are both images of haystacks, although Monet himself would have told you that the subject in this case absolutely did not matter. He um, painted the facades of churches. He um, painted haystacks, he just found things where um, he thought um, there could be sort of an interesting play of light. And he painted those objects or surfaces again and again, different times of day and different weather, different seasons, so that he could record this play of light. And he talked about how he would squint his eyes and look for, you know, these shining spots of yellow or you know these other colors of peach here and there and so he was really sort of responding to color and responding to light and to him the subject really didn't matter that much so it's that process that gives us these wonderful works that we um, associate with French Impressionism. Monet's um, Japanese bridge on the left that's at the Princeton University Art Museum and this gorgeous depiction of his wife, Madame Monet, um, on a windy day with her parasol there and her, um, her veil sort of being blown back against her face. They're these wonderful and, um, and, and really sort of evocative images that, that have, are just loved around the world. So, Let's think a little bit about how we got there. These, I mean, these are like full-blown Impressionist paintings. What was Monet doing earlier on? And this is sort of a classic comparison in early Impressionism. Um, what we're looking at here is a painting by Claude Monet on the left and a painting by Auguste Renoir on the right. And they probably look pretty similar because the artists were sitting right next to each other painting together on the same day. And the year here is 1869, and the title of these works is Le Grenier, um, forgive my French pronunciation, <laughs> and if I'm remembering correctly, the title there roughly means the cheese wheel, <laughs> because what we're looking at here in both images is a round, man-made island that is connected by these little bridges 
um, one to the shore, to the shore on the left, and then on the right, it sort of connects to what looks like a floating restaurant. And so in both images, we see people assembling on this little island. We see people swimming in the water, boats in the, in the background and in the foreground. But we see both artists sort of laying out these canvases, sketching out these canvases with very loose brushwork. I love the way that the water is rendered in both of these images. Um, and, I, and I bring in these two images because very importantly, both of these artists are sitting outside and observing everyday life, recording what life in Paris or just outside of Paris looked like which is key for when it comes to looking at cafes. Um, and you wouldn't have really arrived at this as an idea without this man. His name is Auguste, or sorry, um, Gustave Co uh, um, Coubert. And he was sort of the leader in the movement of realism, which sort of came about around 1850. So, um, 10, 15 years before we really see the rise of Impressionism. He was also a French artist and he created incredibly influential works. This is a self-portrait of the artist. Um, the kinds of works he were, was creating were images like this. This is the Stonebreakers from 1849 on the left and the Wheat Sifters from 1854 on the right. Both of these images are about labor. They are about <laughs> the um, difficult lives of poor people. And before the rise of realism, artists, for the most part, were not creating images that looked like this at all. They didn't aspire to create images that looked like this. These aren't necessarily beautiful images to look at. Um, instead, you have artists who wanted to make grand historical images or grand religious images, or they sought to secure portrait commissions from the wealthy and the powerful. But Gustave Courbet was very dedicated to only painting what he observed in everyday life, in real life. He once famously said, show me an angel and I'll paint you one. So he was going to record the, the, the backbreaking work that he observed real people doing, the stonebreakers in particular, I always notice these torn clothes, the sort of tattered edges of the clothing. And then I always think about the physical difficulty of breaking stones and how, how hard a life that is. And that somebody bothered to record it is really kind of amazing. So one of, um, one of Courbet's um, greatest works or best known works is this one here, which is called The Burial at Ornan. I know many of you are world travelers and you probably re remember seeing this work in person at the Musée d'Orsay. It's certainly not um, everyone's favorite there, but it really makes an impression because it's one of the biggest. It's over 10 feet long and it hangs very high, very, um, almost probably over eye level. So it, um, as you're looking at it, these figures kind of overwhelm you. But when you're standing right in front of it, you are standing here, right at the mouth of this grave um, in this burial scene. So you can see a casket is being um, carried in over here. We see um, representatives of the church over here. The male mourners are kind of front and center. The female mourners are kind of relegated to the right side. And you can see most of them have kind of turned their heads away out of um, respect or perhaps out of an overwhelming feeling of emotion. Um, but what Corbet is really doing here is that he is not really, he's taken a very sort of banal everyday subject <laughs> And um, he has depicted it on a grand scale, but he hasn't made any of this beautiful. Um, we have everyday looking people <laughs> over here and even front and center, and even just putting the mouth of a grave right here um, at, at the, at the um, foreground in the center of this picture, just kind of emphasized just how, um, how simple and how matter of fact and how everyday this topic is, despite its, its kind of overwhelming 
um, presence in the galleries. So it's Gustave Courbet that gives us this idea of everyday life and nothing more. And that was very influential for um, some of our Impressionist artists that we're going to be looking at. So our next idea is to kind of connect <laughs> all of these ideas, Impressionism, Realism, and cafes. So thinking about being a world traveler, here we are looking at two very famous spots in Paris, France. And I know a lot of you have been to Paris and probably love Paris as much as I do. And if you've been there, you might have sat right out here in front of um, what is probably the best known cafe in all of Paris, Les Deux Magots. Um, there are several very famous spots where we know that um, artists and philosophers and, and writers would gather and, and socialize and share ideas. And what we're seeing is essentially a restaurant with a lot of outdoor seating where you can sit outside and watch the world go by. And when you're in Paris, that essentially means that the entire world becomes like your fashion show. Um, you get to take, a, take in all of the sights and sounds and, and, and the beauty of, of just the people that live there. So cafes have been an essential part of Parisian life for centuries. And, um, and they were sort of at a heyday almost, at a cultural heyday um, as the um, impressionist artists were working. I also bring in this image of the Moulin Rouge, which is, uh, or was a very famous nightclub in Paris. And, um, and as we go through many of these images, what we'll see is that um, there was a fine line sometimes between cafe, cafe concert, and, um, and these nightlife uh, venues. So, um, so at the heart of them, they were all a place to sort of gather like a modern day piazza, share ideas, drink, flirt. <laughs> so we're going to be looking in some cases at cafes, at some in, in some cases more like nightclubs, um, but they all sort of have that essential purpose in common. So let's take a look at Edouard Manet, who is our first artist here who kind of um, internalizes these ideas of realism and impressionism and marries them together for us. And what we're looking at here is his great work, which is known as The Music in the Tuileries, 1862. So this is a huge sort of park garden just outside the Louvre in Paris. And in this case, the, these people would have been assembled for a, a concert. We don't see any of the musicians playing. We just see all the people gathered together. And in our, from my modern day perspective, this idea of social distancing comes into mind and all of these people are just too close. <laughs> but we get a good sense of what um, sort of upper class or bourgeois class of people looked like um, in the 1860s in Paris. Um, we have all these men with their tall hats and black jackets on. Um, we have a sea of those hats um, going back into the distance. We have well-dressed women in hats and veils and these sort of enveloping coats and dresses. We see that an event like this draws people of all ages, including children. Um, and then we also see Manet, in this case, not really necessarily using a consistent sketchy brushstroke, but in some cases just giving us flat patches of color, like my eye always goes to this umbrella that's sitting here in the foreground um, that hasn't really been shaded or modeled and just kind of sits there, um, not fully integrated into the picture. So we see Manet experimenting with, you know, painting that which he could observe in everyday life and using sort of this rough, sketchy technique in order to achieve it. Um, what we do see here, and what seems to be sort of um, <clears throat> essential to the French Impressionist um, view of depicting a genre scene or a scene of everyday life, is the idea of leisure. The French Impressionists really like to depict um, Parisians enjoying life as opposed to breaking stones or sifting wheat. <laughs> uh, our next image from Manet, I just wanted to show you briefly, is just to show you how um, his approach to Impressionist painting sort of evolves over the years. This is about um, 12 years later, 1874, and this is just known as boating. This is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a gorgeous image. I am a sucker for these blues. Um, 
and we see a man seated at the end of a rowboat with his uh, um, forearm resting on the oar. He looks out at us directly, whereas the, the woman, his companion, is sitting in profile. And so we see this um, sketchy, rough, um, impressionist technique, particularly in the water and in the execution of her dress. Um, but we also see this idea of recording everyday life, recording a leisure activity socializing, pleasure, all these wonderful things. So um, this idea of recording everyday life sort of is um, married to or connected to this idea of being a flaneur. Now this is a concept from literature from the same time um, and it's introduced by Baudelaire. But uh, in essence, um, being a flaneur means um, being an observer of modern urban life, a detached observer of modern everyday life. And, um, and as we look back on it, it's um, really being <laughs> an implied male observer. <laughs> so there's a lot of images like this um, by uh, a, an artist from the same time period who um, isn't always ca uh, categorized as an impressionist artist, but he certainly sort of um, interacted with and kind of shared a lot of the same philosophies. The artist here is um, Gustav Kayaba. And so we're looking at his image of a man wearing one of these top hats and black coats. He's leaning over um, what's probably a second or third story balcony um, and kind of surveying the land around him. And because we're, our perspective is just over his shoulder, we get to sort of adopt his perspective. Um, this idea of being um, an observer of modern life. Here's a photograph from roughly the same time period, and you can sort of immediately spot the man who might be the flaneur in this case. And I wanted to, again, this man with the top hat and the black coat, I wanted to read you a contemporary description of these flaneurs. Um, he's the kind of man um, who is a mobile, mobile and passionate daguerreotype who retains the faintest traces of things and in whom is reproduced with their changing reflections, the flow of events, the city's movement, the multiple physiognomy of the public mind, the beliefs, the antipathies, and the admirations of the crowd. I love this description of somebody being a passionate daguerreotype, that, that all of these things that they observe are being sort of impressed upon them and, and sort of stamped upon them and, um, and reproduced in, in them so that they can share them in their writing or in their artwork. And here's another work by Gustav Kayabat, um, and another man sort of, again, kind of surveying land, and we as the viewer are looking over his shoulder. And I just want to zoom in on this one because I think what he's looking at is very important. At first glance, it might look like an empty square, but <laughs> there is a woman down there that he seems to have his eye on. Um, the woman who's at the middle of this empty street that he could very well be um, watching as, as, as she moves about doing her business. And so we get this sense of the implied male viewer when it comes to the flaneur. The flaneur is, is never really considered, considered to be a woman. So in this case, we kind of have the idea of the kind of the feminist art historical idea of the woman as an object. Um, and that the, the idea of the male gaze comes into, into play here because that's the idea where just by looking at someone, there's, um, there's a power relationship there. And I think that we've all experienced this in some way. Um, and I always think of like the classic examples, you know, if you're in kind of a dining hall or a cafeteria, if you drop your tray or you spill a, or break a glass or something like that, all eyes are on you. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling. It's a power relationship. You don't want to be observed and yet you're being observed. And that's certainly the dynamic when we talk about um, the, the male gaze. Um, the male gaze can turn a, a woman or the subject <laughs> into an object um, and, and it creates a power dynamic between two individuals. So continuing on with this idea, Gustav Kayabat in this case created a lot of images that kind of speak to this idea of or suggest this idea of power 
in the gaze. He, um, the images on, or the image on the right, I should say, shows two men on a balcony overlooking um, Haussmann Boulevard in Paris and, um, and sort of looking down on a crowd. And then on the left, we have another image by the same artist of kind of that perspective of looking down on the world. And certainly when you're up above everybody else, it does change your perspective and it creates again that kind of power dynamic. Gustave Kayabat gives us some of these incredible images of people out on the streets of Paris, and in particular men out on the streets of Paris, observing everyday life, taking it all in. Um, so we have the Art Institute of Chicago's uh, incredible painting, Paris Street on a Rainy Day from 1877 on the left. And then um, Kayabat's other well-known painting called um, Le Pont de l'Europe, with another couple out on a stroll. This image is located at the Petit Palais in Paris. So in the image on the left, we have um, this prominent couple uh, dressed, you know, upper middle class. And, um, and they are among many other sort of groups that are kind of clustered under these umbrellas on a rainy day. And they're taking in the sights and sounds. Um, even though they're coming right towards us, the viewer, we see, that they are engaged visually with looking at something or someone else. Um, and you get the sense that it's most likely a person. Um, so it sort of speaks to that idea of being the observer of modern life. We get that sense over here on the right as well. It's sort of harder to deduce the relationship between the man and the woman in this image here. He looks as though he's a few feet ahead of her, but maybe leaning over to kind of hear her speak, or perhaps he's stopping to look at her. But again, we have this sense, even with the man leaning over the edge of the bridge here on the railing, um, the sense of being a detached observer of modern life. And Monet gives us a little bit of this. Monet almost exclusively sticks to landscape painting, but every now and then, he, um, particularly earlier on in his career, he would show us um, sort of an unusual snapshot of everyday life. And in this case, I've always found this painting to be so unusual. This is sort of classic Monet in the background with a woman in a parasol and um, uh, all these red flowers. But in the foreground, we actually have Madame Monet um, sitting on a park bench, um, looking sort of mournful, maybe even slightly upset about being painted. And then we have this man um, leaning in behind her that she is either unaware of or possibly even annoyed by. Looks like he has brought her flowers too. So I all, I've always sort of looked at him as being a Flannar type, um, but maybe even somebody who's making advances, unwanted advances here. Um, although we do know that Madame Monet um, had a very ill father when this was painted. So this could have been a neighbor who was just paying his respects. Um, but this relationship between young women and young men who are observing them is something that we see in so many artists' work at this time. So now we're sort of switching gears and looking at the artist Renoir. And this is one of his beloved paintings um, called Umbrellas. It was painted over several years in the 1880s. And we see, it's interesting in this picture, um, that sort of the, the, I would say the focus of this picture, there's almost like two, folk, two areas of focus in, in this picture. Um, we see a lot of detail in this young girl over here. But this young woman in the foreground on the left is looking out at us, is also looking out at us directly and um, sort of engages us as a kind of a sympathetic figure here. And just behind her, we see this young man in a top hat who almost looks like he's approaching her from behind or observing her from behind. So in this crowded, busy scene with all of these different umbrellas here, we get that sense of, of the modern day flaneur. So what we see in several images, many images from, um, from this time period, is sort of a sense of the vulnerability, vulnerability of um, upper middle class women as they are out and about 
in, um, in the city. So we have, again, another work by Renoir here with this woman who looks as though she's just stepping off of the sidewalk. We have all of these young men in their top hats, and we almost get this, this um, impression of, of almost like distress as she's moving about the city here. Um, she does not look as though she's at peace. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of sort of agitated brushwork in this work as well. Um, Renoir doesn't create many works that are explicitly set in a cafe, but here we have a work that he explicitly called the cafe from 1874-75. And, um, and this is another one that sort of speaks to the vulnerability of women in Paris in the last quarter of the century. And this idea of the male gaze sort of transforming a woman from a subject into an object. So we have two beautiful women sitting at a small cafe table. Their interest and attention seems to be um, either on this figure just in front of them or maybe something beyond. Um, but you can't look at them without noticing this young man who's sitting behind them, who seems um, engaged with what they're doing, almost entertained by their presence, that they, that they are providing the entertainment for him. So this interesting dynamic between men and women comes up quite a bit in Renoir's painting. Most people are very familiar with this work, um, a really sort of gorgeous, polished work by the artist Renoir, that's called La Loge, which is um, like a, a box seat at the, at the Paris Opera. So we have this woman who's all dolled up as, as one gets when they go to the Paris Opera, but she's got, you know, um, gorgeous earrings and strands and strands of pearls, um, golden bracelets and flowers in her hair and, and at, her, at, at her waist here in just this unbelievable dress. And, um, and she looks like a china doll, right? I mean, a porcelain doll. She's just absolutely gorgeous. But she, she's really more like an object than a human here. And that's really underscored by how her companion is acting. He has his opera glasses up and he's looking upwards and you get the sense that he is just not watching a show, but instead looking at other, other people, presumably other women, who are also at the Paris Opera. Renoir, it was sort of a savvy depictor of, um, of these kind of gender politics from this time period. So here we have an image that's called Leaving the Conservatory. This is at the Barnes Foundation. It dates to 1871. And, um, and we have this sort of interesting interaction that's taking place here with a crowd of people, two young girls being approached by two young men. And you see um, a great deal of confidence in this young man in the foreground. He's striding forward, one arm um, in front, one arm in back. He's being supported by his friend here. And you can tell that he is making his advances. And the young woman who is the object of his affection seems a little uncertain about um, what's happening here and her friend seems to be offering some some moral support. So it's these scenes of the gatherings, these scenes of people coming together, the slice of life in Paris at this time that I think really kind of capture people's imagination. And I think people kind of enjoy these pictures even more than just say a standard Monet landscape. There's more to look at, there's more to sort of take apart in these images. So this is one of Renoir's most famous, most beloved images. And it's not specifically a cafe. Um, it's known as the ball or the dance at the Moulin de la Galette, which was sort of like an outdoor nightclub. <laughs> but what we see here is an event that's taking place in broad daylight. And we see um, people of uh, all ages. We've got a child right here in the foreground. But it's really sort of dominated by young couples and people kind of just interacting, socializing in a way that I, I'm, I know all of us miss right now <laughs> in the age of COVID-19. Um, so we see couples seemingly looking out at us, couples um, lost in the fun of dancing here. And then we've got this great group of two women um, leaning over this bench 
and the three young men that they seem to be um, kind of interacting with. And the whole thing is rendered in that beautiful sort of sketchy painterly quality that Renoir had with this attention to light and shadow. I love the sun dappled back of this gentleman who we see from behind. And so we see this really sort of joyful scene. Um, there's, um, there's little of that stress and tension that we, that we saw in some of his other scenes where we, where we really get the sense that women are being kind of observed almost against their will. <laughs> um, and here we have these smiling young women front and center and they're, they're just beautiful and everybody seems to just be so, so content on, on a beautiful day. And that's very similar to Renoir's um, sort of other most famous work, and that is The Luncheon of the Boating Party from 1876. And this work is located in the United States of the Phillips Collection um, in DC. So we have this gorgeous assembly of people um, with maybe sort of a flanner type in the background, but he's not even engaged in, in looking. Um, we just have people engaged in discussions, in flirting. We have them at this um, outdoor restaurant. These are probably Parisians who have boated in and are enjoying the wine and the food that is at, uh, painted at the center of the foreground here. And um, there's just sort of, kind of this wonderful push and pull of figures here. Um, the exchange, of, the meaningful exchange, <laughs> exchanges of glances that are happening um, with figures um, looking at each other and, and some figures not looking at others. And then of course the woman with her dog over here in the foreground on the left. So it's joyful, it's a slice of life, it's um, people interacting. It's an, a, a scene of everyday life, but it's a particularly beautiful scene of leisure. And this is probably what Renoir is best known for. So things are going to get a little bit more scandalous as we look at the work of Degas, because he was not always painting things that were sort of sanctioned by sunshine the same way that um, Renoir was. But I think in order to fully appreciate where Degas goes, you have to understand kind of the alternative to what Degas was, and that was Mary Cassatt. So just very briefly, let's consider <laughs> who Mary Cassatt was and what she was doing. So she was an American painter working in Paris, friends with the Impressionist artists, particularly Degas. But because she was a female artist, she wasn't sort of out and about. She was a female artist of a certain um, sort of uh, class level too. She wasn't out and about on the streets of Paris at all hours of the night. Instead, she got, um, she got commissions and she did her paintings um, primarily within the domestic realm. And so she gives us these incredible works like this one, T from 1880, a beautiful painting, but you can almost feel the restraint here, the social restraint as these two young women who are there to presumably enjoy each other's company. They don't even look at each other. They seem um, sort of lost in their own worlds. And um, in Mary Cassatt, was sort of expert at doing that. I look at these two images of women reading um, from the late 1870s, and this is sort of like what life looks like now for many people these days, right? You're kind of stuck at home and you're taking in the news. Um, but her good friend and um, contemporary, Degas, was doing something very different. He was not stuck at home, <laughs> um, but he was of generally the same kind of class as Mary Cassatt. And so um, he would paint women, sometimes in a domestic sphere, um, like what we see here. This is a really interesting painting that he did called The Song Rehearsal. Um, he was always very interested in performers. And in this case, it's two women that could have been like his sisters, essentially, something that he could have seen very often. Um, within the setting of a home, kind of rehearsing a song as though they were opera performers. <laughs> and we have um, little details here, like the piano and that sort of thing. Um, and so we have Degas with this interest in performance, but because of his um, identity as a male artist, he could go out and about throughout Paris at nighttime and take in the sights and sounds. 
And that meant that he was painting what are called cafe concerts, which were sort of the um, sort of the equivalent of almost vaudeville for the time period. So they were kind of risque performances, um, maybe sort of overtly sexual. Uh, they oftentimes took place on stages um, out, outdoor in outdoor settings, but where there were um, crowds and usually bars and drinking uh, involved. So uh, many of his compositions are very similar. We have the performers on the stage here. We have kind of an orchestra pit in the middle ground, kind of framed up by this curling scroll here from a musical instrument. And then we have the crowd kind of in the foreground um, with women depicted here, but in this case, they would not be the kind of woman that you would bring home to mom, right? These were um, maybe more um, lower class women. So we have the cafe concert here. We actually know even um, the specific uh, venue where this was painted. Another scene, a very similar layout here um, at the same cafe concert. And, um, and again, still that frame up with the curling volute here from the uh, orchestra pit with our performers up on stage here. I love these colors that he was using. And this is one of Degas' most famous works from this period of his artwork. And this one is, has the nickname of the Song of the Dog. <laughs> and it gives you a sense of the kind of performance we're looking at here. So this is from 1877. And we have this sort of um, plump woman kind of in this pouty pose. And I think Degas has taken some great lengths here to give us a real sense of this woman. Um, but to not to glamorize her. She, she's not necessarily a beautiful woman, is she? She's got these almost black eye sockets here. She's got um, this pile of kind of untamed red, reddish hair. And she seems almost comical, but also almost sinister. Um, our background is rendered in a very sketchy manner. We have just the suggestion of the crowd around her many of these performers had this kind of over-the-top kind of dramatic um, way about them, which was all part of the cafe concert. So we have a specific performer here, um, Madame Becat, Mademoiselle Becat, um, who's taking her dramatic bow at the end of her show um, with, again, these sort of almost aggressively unattractive figures in the foreground who would have been the attendees here. One last image of a performer that Degas gives us that I just love, and this is one that's probably familiar to many of you because this is um, located at the um, Fog Museum at Harvard, and this is just called um, Singer with a Glove. This dates to 1878, and it's so dramatic, right? It's so striking, and we all know from we all, we've all adopted this pose in some way or another at our, in our own lives. And it's a great way to sort of emphasize what is coming out of your mouth, you know? And here we know she's belting out a tune and we can just imagine the strength of her voice there. I love this sort of fluffy ethereal quality of her costume around her um, arm and around her neck and how it contrasts with the sharpness of how that black glove is painted and then it all stands out against that um, striped background there. We've got the dramatic uplighting on her face that kind of throws her eyes into shadow. It's, it's just a really dramatic painting that I think is so fantastic. All right, so Degas gives us some great performers, but he's also really interested in the people who are attending. So this was our sort of title slide here, and it's a work that he entitled The Spectators, dates to about 1877. And I should mention, I've been calling all of these works paintings, but some of these works are pastels. And so work like this and several of these cafe concerts are, are pastel works. We can see, um, the performer down on stage here, in the upper right. And then what we're really being treated to is almost like <laughs> the behind the scenes of what it's like for the, um, the audience 
who's engaged at, at these shows. And I think what, what Degas is really highlighting for us is kind of some flirtation that's happening here with what is presumably a woman of sort of a lower social standing. So, um, so we have the sense that this, this man here does not know or has just recently introduced himself to this woman here and they're both kind of leaning dramatically towards each other in order to make this connection. Dega gives us a lot of images of women who are of a lower class. These are women that Mary Cassatt would have never hung out with and never painted. Um, they, these are women that he does not try to really make beautiful. He gives them these kind of over-the-top costumes too, where you can tell that they're trying to attract attention. The title of this work is Women on Cafe Terrace from 1877. This is at the Musée d'Orsay. These are the type of women that you would see out and about at, at, um, at night in Paris. Um, and they weren't necessarily the kinds of women that an upper class man should be hanging out with, but they could be spending their time with. Degas also gives us um, the activities of what people were doing in these cafe and cafe concerts. And so we have this famous and one of my most beloved images that he's created the absinthe or the absinthe drinkers from 1873. This is also at the Musée d'Orsay. And so what we're looking at here are two, uh, two figures who are presumably in a cafe or kind of a social setting like that. And you can't really tell if they're there together. They're sitting kind of close. It looks as though they're sharing a table. And in front of this woman is a faintly green goblet of, of drink that is the absinthe, which is said to um, have sort of hallucinogenic properties to it. It was just a very strong alcohol. So we get the sense that she's sort of in this drunken stupor. Um, and so here she is kind of alone in a crowd, lost within herself, um, lost in thought. And, um, and so it's, a, it's kind of a seedier side of life when it comes to what Paris was like in the last quarter century, last quarter of the 1800s. And it's an element of life that Degas gives us um, quite a bit. Here we have another woman, it's just called At the Cafe. She's by herself, she's drinking. It almost looks as though she's playing a card game, maybe solitaire. Um, again, this sort of elaborate outfit. She's trying to attract attention. And she's not necessarily a beautiful woman here. She's sort of a dangerous woman, isn't she? Um, but one of my favorite images that Degas gives us of a cafe is this one here. It's just called At the Cafe, 1877. And we see these two women who are sort of interacting with each other in what I've always perceived to be a really emotional way. Um, the woman on the left seems to be kind of in pain and the woman on the right really seems genuinely concerned. And in between them in the background is this kind of chaotic sort of slashing um, rough paintwork that, that Degas uh, renders very quickly, you can tell. And so I, you know, out of all of these images, this seems to be kind of like the most emotional, um, uh, the, or we see the most vulnerability. And I think it just stands in such stark contrast to the kinds of images that um, Mary Cassatt was producing around the same time um, where we see kind of the strict rules of society and even, you know, the rigidity of the vertical lines of the wallpaper here um, in contrast with, um, with kind of the wild freedom that you might see if you were out and about in the cafes of Paris at the time. Okay. So, Let's switch gears to the last major artist that we're going to be considering. And he does so many wonderful scenes of cafes and cafe concerts. And that is the, uh, the artist Edward Manet. So this is just sort of a, a great counterpoint to the absinthe drinkers. He's um, given us a woman who's sitting, seemingly sitting by herself in a cafe setting. This is another work that's just called um, Oh, it's, um, it's actually called The Plum. This is at the National Gallery of Art, dates to 1878. And so we have a woman who, again, sort of seems lost in thought, not 
not necessarily because of absinthe at the time, <laughs> uh, this time. She's smoking a cigarette. She's rather well dressed, but it again sort of speaks to this idea of um, of sort of seeking out connection, going to a public place like this, but still feeling that that sense of disconnect, um, that uh, being lost in thought, um, still being sort of uh, seeking, perhaps seeking com companionship, but still being very lonely. And we have that idea kind of represented again and again in Manet's work. This is a cafe concert from 1879. This is at the Walters Art Museum. And we have, it's a stunning work and I love it for just being this incredible slice of life um, for this time period, rendered in this great impressionistic brush, brushwork. I love the way this gentleman's face is painted. Um, so in the background, we see the cafe concert performer I typically interpret this woman in the middle ground as almost being like a barmaid um, at this venue, even though she's standing there enjoying her own drink. And then sitting at the bar is this um, sort of distinguished looking flaneur type. Um, and then next to him, a young woman who just like the woman we saw, seems again, very lost in thought. I think there might be a cigarette between her fingers too. Everybody's got um, a big sign of, of beer in front of them, but there is this real disconnect between everyone. Um, they're all looking in different directions. <laughs> they're all thinking about different things. They're here, they've all come together, but they're not connecting in, in real and meaningful ways. So, um, so it really sort of speaks to kind of this this very modern feeling that people have sometimes when they are when they're in, in social gathering spaces. So this is sort of a reminder, we don't necessarily need to rush out and see people in the age of COVID-19 because if this were painted today, we'd all be looking at our cell phones, right? All right, so Manet gives us just a few more images that look uh, quite a bit like this. We've got, um, again, um, figures kind of looking in different directions, bellied up to the bar with their beer, beer steins. In this case, this young woman looks sort of happy, rather pleasant, but then your eye goes back to this incredible profile of this young woman over here who looks lost in thought and um, you know, slightly distressed by whatever seems to be troubling her. And then the last cafe concert he gives us is another one where we seem to see a barmaid standing up, um, a performer in the upper left, and then observers and spectators throughout. We even see some musicians here in the middle ground too. So again, people looking in all different directions, this kind of sense of of a modern day kind of disconnect between all of these people who have come together to experience something together, to enjoy something together, um, and it's not quite being accomplished here. And Manet probably uh, fully achieves this with his work, um, The Bar of the Folie Bergère, which is one of his late masterworks. This dates to 1882. Um, if you've been to London anytime, you've probably seen this in person at the Courtauld Museum. Um, and so what we're looking at here is, again, not technically a cafe or a cafe concert. The Folie Bergère was um, a performance venue, a, a huge theater that was U-shaped. And in this case, you can probably just make out the little tiny green feet of a trapeze artist sort of hanging down here from the top left. And then we have our barmaid sitting here, or standing here, staring directly out at us. Um, she is rendered as beautifully and almost with as much detail as the still life right here in the foreground of the bar and all the glasses and these clementines and the rose um, right in front of her. And then we have this interesting detail over here in the upper right. And that is sort of a young man who, or a gentleman who, looks for all the world to be like this flaneur type we've been talking about. And he is approaching the bar, presumably to order a drink or to interact with this young woman. Um, the face that Manet shows us is of a decidedly sort of disinterested young woman. You know, she seems lost in thought or maybe really sort of disappointed with her, uh, with her work and, and what she has to do. But the, the reflection 
that he shows us in this mirror. And I, and I, um, uh, generally speaking, this is understood to be a mirror because of this golden frame. So this would be her reflection back here. Seems more engaged. It seems as though she's leaning forward, maybe with a little bit more pep in her step than what we see here. And if this is a mirror behind her, that means that we, the viewer, are essentially in the place of this, of this man. We are that male figure approaching her. And so this is the expression that, that we are intended to see as, as that male viewer, as the flaneur. And then we see the reflection of all the crowds taking in the show across the balcony from her. So, um, so Manet was always really interested in this in these um, intriguing dynamics of people interacting in public spaces, in these social spaces um, in Paris at this time. Manet died the year after he completed the bar at the Folie Berger, but I wanted to show you briefly um, a preparatory sketch that he did for the painting, which kind of gives us another take on what he was trying to accomplish over here with this young woman um, interacting with the, with the man approaching the bar. And it, I, I just think it's so interesting that he originated with the idea that he was, that this gentleman would be sort of at a lower level than her. And then over here, it's a, a, he's kind of in a more of a position of authority or power in the finished work. So, as I mentioned, Manet passes away shortly after this work is accomplished. So what, are the, what do the other Impressionist artists do going into the 1880s and 90s and then into the uh, 20th century? Well, Degas, he sort of stops going to all of these cafe concerts. And I think part of that is because he sort of ages out of it. <laughs> and so we begin to see him really focusing on images of ballet dancers. Um, he was doing that prior to, but they, they become a primary focus, as do um, just female nudes and the subject of sort of the woman at her bath. I think both of these subjects allow allowed Degas to explore um, human anatomy in sort of strange and unusual poses, sometimes very awkward poses. But um, I think as these artists became more established too, they could afford to hire models as opposed to going out and observing things in everyday life. Um, our good friend Monet, of course, just stuck to the landscapes. In fact, he retreated to them. He created his own um, water lily garden um, at his home in Giverny outside of Paris and um, created some of the most iconic images associated with Impressionism. The work on the right here is um, from 1919 and at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, just an unbelievably gorgeous water lily paintings. Renoir, on the other hand, or sort of similar to Degas, um, stops creating such ambitious group pictures, uh, uh, these slice of life pictures, the, the genre pictures of um, cafes and balls and people dancing. And instead he really starts focusing on the female nude as well. Again, I think it's because he's more established, he can hire um, models. And so these works, the bathers are both from the Barnes Foundation and date to the early part of the 20th century. So after all these artists sort of move on, and again, I sort of say they age out of going to the concert halls and, and the shows, you do have kind of the, the next generation of artists, artists like um, Toulouse-Lautrec, um, who we see here, who starts going to the Moulin Rouge and frequenting the nightclubs and, and showing us um, it in with a sort of a new style of painting, what, um, the, what the sort of club scene in Paris looks like. I've always loved this image here from the Moulin Rouge of this woman's face illuminated by the limelight. Uh, and Toulouse-Lautrec, oh, and it certainly reminds me, of course, of Degas' um, singer with the glove, whose face is sort of uplit by the stage lighting here. Um, Toulouse-Lautrec gives us great posters um, advertising the Moulin Rouge and specific performers. Um, Jeanne Avril with her very saucy kind of can-can like dance over here. La Galou, another performer over here um, with this very sort of energetic dance. And these works are certainly kind of um, coming out of what Degas had achieved um, a decade or two before Toulouse-Lautrec. 
um, framing up the images in the same sort of way with the performers and the musicians and their instruments. We also have artists like Van Gogh, who explored to some degree this idea of what a cafe or what a bar might look like in his work. This is um, the, sorry, the um, 1888 Night Cafe, the famous work that's at the um, Yale Museum. And here it's a work that's really all about color but it is in so many ways tied back to what Degas had accomplished with this kind of monochromatic canvas of the absinthe drinker over here on the, on the left. We do have these people who look very deep into their drinks over here and have that same kind of social disconnect um, that uh, Van Gogh managed to sort of heighten and take to a more sort of emotional extreme by the clashing colors that he used in the space. So that pretty much winds this up for us and it gives us a really good sense of how far we've come in just a few short decades. Um, we have, we've gone from these beautiful sort of soft colors and, and the soft brushwork of somebody like, um, of, of, of somebody like Renoir on the left, all the way to <laughs> sort of a different kind of exploration of social life um, in France at this time to Van Gogh on the right. So I hope you had a great time sort of learning a little bit more about the Impressionists and how and why they were frequenting all of these cafes and cafe concerts and dances and, um, and sort of what they accomplished by, by sharing these images with us. So thank you for sharing this experience with me and I hope to see you again real soon. I appreciate you um, and, and uh, your attention. Thanks so much.